awesome if everybody in the world could experience this? Amen. That's kind of what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're continuing in our study through the book of James. And as we mentioned when we started this series, James is written to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And we started this series because I feel that many of us today are scattered. You know, we're not able to be plugged in with the church as much as we would like to. We're kind of scattered out among the nation. And uh, James writes to help Christians stay faithful while enduring trials. Uh, chapter 1, verse 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. And so it's, it's a book written to help us stay faithful while things aren't going easy for us. But James is not just about remaining faithful. James understands that as Christians, we have a job to do in the world. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So we need to make sure we never forget that we have a responsibility. It's easy to get so concerned and so focused on remaining faithful that we forget we're supposed to be sharing the faith as well. And part of the way we do that is not just with our words, but with our actions. And James understands this because throughout the book, he gives instructions for living out our faith in the presence of the nation as a witness to them while we are scattered. One uh, our faith must be a visible aspect as we saw last week or have a visible aspect as we saw last week. And James has given instructions on this throughout the epistle. In chapter 1, verse 22, he says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. And last week we saw that faith without deeds is dead. But in addition to doing, there are many other lessons on how we speak while we are among the nations. He says in chapter 1, verse 19, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And then in chapter 1, verse 26, he said, If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. It's all a package deal. What comes out of our mouth, what we say, and how we act are all one part of the same package. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 12, he says, speak and act as those who, will be, who are going to be judged according to the law that gives freedom. And so we have to make sure <clears throat> that our speech and our actions are work together to proclaim the gospel. And keeping both of these two in sync not always the easiest thing to do. Many of us have heard people say, I don't go to church because they're just all a bunch of hypocrites. Do you, any of you heard that before? Go ahead and raise your hand. How many of you said it? I did years ago. Uh, and, and the reason people say this is because the words that come out of the mouths of Christians doesn't always align with what they do. Christians sometimes uh, we, we speak of love, but we don't always act real loving to one another. We speak of purity, but we don't always act very pure. We speak of humility, but we don't always act very humble. And sometimes it's easy to speak as if we know what we're talking about, but not real easy to follow through with that. James understands this. And in order to help his readers be able to present themselves and the gospel in the best possible light, he gives some more instructions. In chapter 3, verse 1, and that's where we're going to be this morning, he's in James chapter 3. In verse 1, he says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And the question I've always had with that statement is, who is going to be doing the judging? It's easy to understand that 
God is going to judge those who, who presume to be teachers more strictly because they might mislead people and take them down the wrong path. Or it could be that the nations around judge those who presume to be teachers because they watch everything and they listen to every word that comes out of the mouth of a preacher and they find every single mistake and flaw in that person's life. And so it could be either way. Uh, but either way you take that, there's uh, negative consequences that can come from either side. Both are tied to what comes out of the mouth. And that's something we all struggle with. In James chapter 3, verse 2, he says, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Now, I'm not going to have a show of hands, but I'm willing to bet that there's no one here who has never had anything come out of their mouth that was incorrect or wrong. There's not any of us here that are perfect. We can all relate to this. And so James then goes into a pretty lengthy discussion on the tongue, such a small little organ that is so powerful, such a small little part of our bodies that has so much influence on everything in our entire lives. Beginning in verse 3, he says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. <clears throat> All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. James doesn't seem to think too highly of the human tongue. You notice that? Probably because he's seen the damage that it can do. And most of us have seen that as well. Uh, most of us here have struggled with what our tongue has done. I'm betting that there's no one sitting here today who can say that they who can't say that there was something they wish they had never said. Nobody here that can say that they've never put their foot in their mouth. This is something that everyone struggles with. But as Christians who are to represent the gospel, this can be especially harmful, especially when we use our tongue in two completely opposite ways, as James mentions in chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. He said, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praises and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water come from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. In other words, for Christians, as James has said earlier, we must keep a tight rein on our tongue. Now, I wonder if Paul had been writing this today, if he would have written, with the same computer, we praise the, our Lord and Father, with that same computer, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. If you're on Facebook, you know what I'm talking about. People who will post all these religious things and then turn around and post something that you're thinking, that's not what Christians should post, but I'm not going to say any more about that. So with all of this in mind, I want us to go back to verse 1 in chapter 3 where he talks about not many presuming to be I want you to think back to when you were in school, for those of you who are out of school now. And I want you to think, who was the teacher that had the most influence on you? And then ask yourself why or how that teacher had that kind of influence. You see, teachers are to pass on wisdom and knowledge. And they've studied, they've learned, they've memorized things, they've gained experience, and now they pass these things on to us usually by giving a lecture 
or some kind of speaking in one way or another. And because they teach, people tend to automatically think that they're wise and understanding. And because people think that they're wise and understanding and will listen to them, then they begin to think themselves as being wise and understanding, and so they speak more. And the more they speak, the more people listen to them. And that can sometimes be a very dangerous thing because not everybody who speaks a lot is truly wise and understanding. Look at all of the Hollywood movie stars who come out and, and have something to say about what's going on in our world around us today. And they do that because people look to them and people will listen to them, but that doesn't mean that they're very wise and understanding. And so we have to be careful of this all the time. James, I believe, actually kind of creates this contrast between those who presume to be teachers and those who are truly wise and understanding, which he discusses next. Because there are those who use their tongues a lot and not always with a good outcome. And then there are those who are truly wise and understanding. Picking up in verse 13, James says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And notice James <coughs> says that wisdom and understanding are not communicated by the tongue necessarily. He says, let them show it by a good life by deeds that come from humility, that comes from wisdom. And that's a very important lesson. Sometimes our actions speak louder than our words, and sometimes they ought to speak more than our words. Going back to James chapter 2, verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Our speech and our actions must be aligned, and since the tongue is dangerous, which he talks about a lot, the most important way for us to demonstrate wisdom and understanding is by our good life. We can't go without ever speaking, but we need to be very cautious about opening our mouth because, as James says, there's a fire in there, and it's not always a good one. In fact, in picking up in verse 14, he says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. And, and in a little bit, he's going to call that wisdom. And, and I was reading through that, and I'm thinking, there's nobody today who harbors bitter envy and selfish ambition and thinks that that's wise. Or do we? You think about all the stuff that's on the media today, on TV and social media, that says, you know, you deserve this or that. You deserve more. Your life should be more. You need to be more educated. You need to be climbing the ladder. You need to become more. And look at all the stuff that we are fed day in and day out about how the rich are abusing the poor in our society and the rich oil companies and the rich pharmaceuticals. It is all done just to create this division between the rich and the poor or to make us think that they are rich and we are poor. And so there's all of this stuff that we look at and listen to that causes nothing but division, but we take it as if we're wise because we know that now. James says in, chapter, in verse 15 and 16, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every. I know I harp on this a lot, but I do believe that most of what we get from the media is exactly this kind of wisdom. It's earthly, it's unspiritual, and it's of the devil. Because all of it causes nothing but disorder and conflict. But there is a true wisdom that we need to guide our lives. Picking up in verse 17 and 18, he says... But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And there's two things I want us to note, want us to notice about that last the, the last couple of verses. First of all, all of this can be connected. Purity can be connected to the tongue. 
what comes out of our mouths can be pure or it can be impure. A peace-loving a characteristic of Christians can also be connected to the tongue. What comes out of our mouth can bring peace or it can bring division. Being considerate can be expressed with the tongue. Being submissive, being full of mercy and good fruit, being impartial, being sincere can all be expressed with our tongue. But another thing I want us to notice about all of these is that they promote peace and healing which we're going to look at a little more next week because disunity is what he's going to talk about next week. But one of the reasons that I say most of the wisdom on TV and social media is earthly and spiritual love the devil is, like I said earlier, is that it promotes division. It causes people to hate others. It causes people to riot. It causes people to protest. It causes all of those kind of things. But what our world needs today, church, is words of actions of peace and humility and submission, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And so our task as Christians is to gain and use this kind of wisdom. And in this day and age with so much division and arguing and fighting taking place in our world, our world needs to see true wisdom. Even while we live in exile, scattered among the nations, as Christians, our task is to be living examples of that wisdom. I began asking, isn't it awesome to have such a loving God that we can come together and worship? And everybody said, Amen. Muffled up, although it was through the mass, everybody said, Amen. Because we all agree with that. We know we have something unique. We have a peace that, that the rest of the world can't seem to grasp. But we need to be showing them what it's like to live in a relationship with a loving God. We need to show them what it's like to, to not be angry all the time and not be afraid all the time and not be worked up all the time. We need to show them that there is another way. Amen? Because that is the good news. That's our task, is to show that to the world in all that we do. Let's pray. Our Father, your, your Son came into this world to bring peace. Peace between you and us. Peace between believers. Peace between all mankind. And Father, if, if people would just come to understand, our world would be so much better. There wouldn't be right. There wouldn't be anger. There wouldn't be the frustration that there is. And I know that the devil still controls a lot in our world today and he's always stirring up more and more because he hates peace. And so I know it's always going to be there, but Father, help us to be a little bit of light in such a dark world. Father, help us to change our heart. Help us to change the way we use our mouths. Help us to guard our tongues and, and look at what we're going to say and evaluate it before it comes out of our mouth. Father, help us to be peacemakers in a world of division. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of songs. The first one is Change My Heart. Uh, and my prayer is that we'll all work on.